email upload folder for the movie, Hidden Figures, and there's literally thousands of emails that we got from the production team asking us for various things, most of which I farmed out to other people and said, hey, could you find this for us? All right, we also provided at least a few props for the movie, uh, one of which is shown in this picture. It's not Mr. Costner, it's a thing behind him hanging on the wall. Um, this is a painting uh, of uh, one of three paintings of the history of flight from Icarus forward, right? And it was done in the 1940s, and it used to hang in the NACA headquarters. And the folks on the production team wanted to have some things that sort of brought out the spirit of, of NASA and NACA, so they wanted to have this picture. Uh, I had dinner with Jim last night, and I, I, you don't mind if I tell the story. Jim, said, Jim tells me that when he saw the movie, he practically leapt out of his chair when he saw this scene, because that painting, after it got taken down off the, the NACA headquarters and got moved over to, you know, it's now Langley, it used to hang in the archives where Jim's office was in the early 90s. So, so he actually has lots of pictures of himself near this pit, near his painting. Um, this is part of this whole fanatical approach on the part of the 20th Century Fox team. Uh, they put a lot of thought into um, uh, locations and settings. It, the film was actually filmed in Atlanta for tax reasons, largely. Uh, but even in Atlanta, they used a lot of uh, sites, uh, you know, sets they used. Uh, there's a party scene. That, that the house where that was actually filmed was a place where Martin Luther King used to meet with people. Uh, so they, they try to infuse a uh, historical sense in the movie, even in ways that, that the audience wouldn't see, but that the, the cast and the staff of the movie would know about. But there's also a lot of clever simplification in the movie in order to help focus on the story of these three women and the computers, and also to make sure it's an entertaining movie. Uh, one of those uh, simplifications is, in fact, Mr. Costner's character, Al Harrison, is completely made up. The real guy who ran the space task group was this guy, Bob Gilbreth. And they didn't use Bob Gilbreth's name on purpose because they knew that the character they're making up was completely, completely made up. Bob Gilbreth, those of you who don't know, right, um, an amazing guy, they should do a movie about Bob Gilbreth. Right? But uh, for purposes of the movie, they wanted to have the space task group head talking to Catherine, and she didn't work for him. Right? She was buried way down in the bureaucracy someplace. Uh, and also, in 1961, 1962, the space task group is growing morphing and changing, and if you're doing a movie, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to keep changing who the person's boss is and changing their character every month or so and during the course of the movie, because that's what was happening at the time. Catherine's boss was changing around. So that was a simplification that was added uh, for purposes of the movie to focus on, on the story of the woman. Another simplification is one that, that many of you here probably uh, drove you nuts when you saw the movie, which is the argument about, you know, could you launch a capsule into the Mercury capsule to orbit on a redstone rocket? I'm seeing some head nods. So, so I was like, I saw the script. I was like, nobody at NASA wondered about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, talking to uh, Ted Melfi, the director, about it, he said, you know, we need to be able to explain to people the math, and this is a way for us to get the math in front of people and make the, the math central to the story. You know, even though it's kind of a made-up excuse for doing it, uh, we, we want to do that. So, so it becomes a key point in the story. All right, let's get the slide over here again. Yeah, there we go. Now, of course, that is sort of the climactic part of the movie is, um, is John Glenn's flight and the successful orbit around the Earth. Um, and here, uh, on, on the question of John Glenn and, and his interaction with Catherine Johnson, the movie uh, folks really wanted to get at least the first part of it right, which was that the wording that John Glenn used about checking the numbers. He actually did ask for the girl, because that's how you know, women computers were referred to at the time. And everybody knew who the girl was in this case, right? That's Kathy Johnson. He actually wanted her to check the numbers. And he said, you know, if she's good with them, I'm ready to fly. It, the actual calculations didn't happen dramatically while John Glenn was in a white room waiting to climb the capsule. <laughs> and, and it didn't take the 30 odd seconds, and actually, I think Ted told me it was like 27 seconds of film time where she's actually doing the calculations. Right? Um, uh, it, it happened long before that. Um, but to me, one of the things that the movie doesn't explain very well is why is she doing it? It's sort of this implication that this might be a problem with the computers. Um, and so they're worried about the computers. Uh, but the real issue was um, whether or not these newfangled IBM computers that they brought in uh, were producing reliable data. So as is the Langley tradition, they checked it by hand, right? Uh, so weeks before the launch, not minutes, uh, Catherine Johnson was told to sit down uh, and took a set of uh, simulated data um, and ran the same calculations that were supposed to be in the computers. Right? Uh, it took her a day and a half even with her speedy mask of it, still, still took a day and a half, working through 11 different variables and computing the answers down to eight significant digits. But her uh, hand calculations gave precisely the same answer that the IBM computers gave, 
and this gave John Glenn and everybody else who was involved uh, the confidence that the electronic computers were actually up to the task of controlling the space flight. Uh, so that's why she did that calculation. There we go. Oh, now it goes. All right, so uh, those of us who were involved uh, with helping with the movie, and there are a lot of people across NASA who were involved in helping with the movie, um, we were you know, we were hopeful, but we never imagined how successful it would be. Uh, and the success of the movie has allowed NASA to leverage this to deliver a message, and not about hidden figures of Langley's history, but about the modern figures, like you see on those posters over there. Um, the, the, the women and minorities that uh, worked for NACA and NASA, the blaze and trail for people who not work at NACA and NASA to follow. Uh, we were able to highlight this in social media and the Modern Figures campaign. We did a Modern Figures toolkit for use in classrooms. And there's lots of other outreach efforts we made to, to get our story out. Uh, and we did this not, not just in LA, to tutor our more about how great uh, NASA and NAC was, but in part because we still have some work to do. And you've heard this earlier this morning from some other folks, but uh, a couple numbers for you. There are only about a third of NASA employees are women, about 6,000 out of the 18,000 uh, NASA civil servants are women. Right? Only about 1,200 of those women are African-American women, and less than half of those people work in science and engineering fields. Uh, so from my perspective as a historian looking at, at the state and, and across NACA and NASA history for over 100 years now, I think the evidence is pretty clear. Your brains and drive aren't determined by race or gender or religion or any other sort of demographic category that's easy to make. Right? Um, and so, uh, you know, diversity in the workforce is something that we ought to be aiming for. And we're hoping that the kids who see this film and have seen the film will see themselves maybe not as, you know, hidden figures or modern figures even, but probably as our future figures. You know, they'll be able to build on the gifts they have and someday they'll be making history themselves working for NASA. Thank you very much.